Hello and welcome to the Randomly Generated History Club, where three non-historians, that's us, <laughs> pick a year at random and try to learn things about it. And I'm Ant, and I'm here with my two friends, Anna and Will. Non-historian. <laughs> Non-historian too. <laughs> <laughs> and this week, we are talking about the year 244. Ish. <laughs> Spoiler alert Very ish <laughs> Well, as is custom uh, I'd like each of us to give our three word preview Anna, what is your three words? Die, orcas, die <laughs> <laughs> Nice Nice, orcas <laughs> Orcas As in the whales Yes, yeah, in the whales, yeah oh, cool. Quite right Yeah mm-hmm. Phil? Phil? No, sorry, that's my one. You legitimately just called me Phil. <laughs> no, because, I, okay, I just gave away my three words. Because <laughs> I, I was looking at them right here. <laughs> so I just... Go on then, you do yours then. No, Phil, I'd like to hear yours. Fine. Until genocide. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> well, mine is Phil the Emperor. <laughs> okay, there we go. We're all quite, um, well, I guess Phil and I are a little violent today. <laughs> I'm going to do that the whole episode. Okay, so today the year is 244. And I am once again in Rome for I think the third time in a row. <laughs> Obsessed. There are no Medicis here. Oh. Uh, they're but the twinkle in the eye of, of a young Roman at the stage. Yeah. Uh, But a lot is happening in Rome at this time, as it tends to always be happening in Rome. Uh, It's a large and sprawling empire, with emperors lasting not very long, people coming in and out. Uh, And there's this instable peace with the Goths in the north beyond the Danube, uh, with tributes being paid to keep them at bay. And there's a war in the east with the Sassanians. And King Shapur the first, who we've covered before. Yeah, Yeah, he's back. Well, he didn't go anywhere. No, he's still here. <laughs> he's, he comes back later. He's back into the things we're thinking about. He's back into our hearts and minds. <laughs> and on the throne in Rome is a child emperor called Gordian III, who came to power at the ripe old age of 13. Oh, oh wow. Gordy. So, as I said, Rome was at war with the Sassanians. Um, and uh, we covered them previously, I believe. Um, but it was in March of 244 that a counterattack from the Sassanians against the Romans uh, caused the Romans to be defeated. And at that battle, uh, Gordian was killed. Oh. So the emperor, was he still a child at the time? He was about 16, I think, at the time. Okay. Uh, you it's know, still he's, sad. He's, he's, he's pretty, pretty young. Yeah. Um, it's unclear, though, if he was killed by his own army or in the battle itself. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, there also could have been a plot to have him killed uh. by the hero of this tale, Philip. Okay. So, who was this rising star? Philip, otherwise known as Marcus Julius Philippus, a.k.a. Philip the Arab, in historical terms. Ah. Philip the Arab. Yes. So, a bit about him. He was born in Syria, not far from Damascus, and likely to a fairly well-to-do family. And his brother, uh, uh, Gaius Julius Priscus, was a senior officer in the Praetorian Guard and was a high-flying official in the Gordian Third's empire. Okay. So there's some scholars that believe that uh, Philip was a Christian uh, due to his subsequent treatment of Christians. And then, oh. uh, you know, Constantine is widely regarded as the first Christian emperor. But th- some say that this, he could be Christian. He most likely was just a, a, a religion of the day, but uh, he's kind of a nice dude towards Christians and his treatment towards them. It's a whole thread on that. Um, but his brother, who was this Praetorian guard, uh, gave him his first big political break when the Praetorian prefect, Tim- Timetheus died under very unclear circumstances. Mm. It's a lot of unclear, mm. un, uh, suspicious deaths. I think, well, say. you know, some scholars think that this was all orchestrated to rise to power. Some yeah. say history is hard to understand and yeah. nobody knows what's going on. And some it's unclear s- because there's no history there. Some say people <laughs> die from yeah. time to time. But uh, Gaia suggested to the child emperor that uh, Philip would be a perfect for the job of the uh, Praetorian prefect. And so he ascended and took the purple, as it were, Ooh. which was the purple robes that they would wear if you're in a station of power. Okay. Because purple was a very royal, regal colour. Yeah. Uh, and the dye was made from an animal. What animal do you think the purple dye was made from? Platypus. Mm-hmm. Platypus. Will? 
Beaver. 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 <laughs> it was actually a combination of the two. You got it both right. Bladipus. Bladipus. No, you're wrong. It's sea snails. No, oh. it's not. It is crushed sea snails. And wow. you get a royal regal purple or dark red sometimes from it. Um, it depends on the snail. No, that's impossible because no one who's ever fought the sea snails has lived to tell the tale. <laughs> <laughs> no, they always send one person back to, to oh, say, tell of them, tell the them the of glories you saw. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're the messenger. Yeah. Well, Philip and Gaius were um, effectively shadow rulers over Gordian uh, uh, and... This is why it's thought they might have plotted to have him killed because okay. they saw this as their chance to rise to power because they were effectively controlling controlling yeah. the, the emperor, em, empire. Uh, regardless if they did it or not, the death of Gordian did suit Philip, who declared himself co-emperor with his brother. And his first act was then to make peace with the Sassanians. So rather than continue this crazy war with them, he withdrew the army from a very, you know, a potentially disastrous campaign. Uh, but he had to give up Armenia to the Persians. Mm. And he had to pay a massive 500,000 denarii indemnity. To wow. Them. So as a sort of a, you know, uh, saws for the war type, type dealing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Saws for the war. <laughs> Should have gotten Here's some money and also Armenia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I've made that deal several times. <laughs> yeah, so passing back Armenia yeah. all the time. He, uh, he has to go back to Rome to be installed as emperor. Uh, Sorry, installed. Installed as emperor. All right, carry yeah. on. Yeah, 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 installed. Like, what, what would you say? Uh, crowned? Cr- crowned no, emperor? I like installed. I yeah, mean, we've yeah. talked about this before, about I installing have... monks. In, <laughs> yes, in, in the Westminster West West Abbey. Abbey. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. God, you could, you could install anything. You can days. install anything. They had to rip yeah. out the old drawers and yeah. install them in there. They had to build <laughs> a, uh, a grown-up chair. They did, Because, yeah. they, you know, from <laughs> um, Gordian. He was a competent ruler for the most part-ish, sort of. Uh, <laughs> wow, that was so many, uh, yeah, so many <laughs> well, like qualifications. He, he befriended the Senate and put together a lot of work packages and stuff and okay. started making his mark. He ruled with m- median mm. competence. I mean, like, <laughs> he's got the outside of competence, but one crippling, crippling downside is that he doesn't really understand money. Um, <laughs> because he embarks on this massive building program on his hometown, renamed it Philippopolis. He did not. He did four P's in that word. <laughs> Philippopolis. Ph- Philippopolis. Phil- ph- okay. Yep. <laughs> Great. Tough one to say. Rolls off the tongue. Um, and he builds lots of statues to himself and his family. Well, he, respect deif- that. he deifies his father. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you know, normally it's reserved for emperors, but he said. Why or, not? you know, dads. Or dads. Uh, he also uh, rang in 1,000 years of the Roman Empire from the founding of Romulus back in the day. Wow. With celebrations in uh, during the feast of the Ludi Secularis, which is like a three-day sort of pagan ritual with several of the Roman yeah. cults there in presence. And he you know, was able to do this massive party. Ludi Secular- Secularis. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Lewd that's... and secular. Not <laughs> yeah. unlike f- Will. <laughs> so, <laughs> Lewd and secular. Um, yeah, no he arguments. also had to pay a very hefty donativium. Do you uh, know what a Donativium is? I think she is the chief of Versace. Donativium <laughs> Versace. She is. He loved Versace. Yeah. Uh, no, what this was is the sort of standard, hmm, bribe. Uh, uh, oh, I mean, it wasn't a bribe. Donativium is just like, just like a donation, right? Yeah, it's just, it's just like, donation. But it was a donation to the army for them to approve your rule. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. So like, who is he bribing? <laughs> He's already bribed the the Persians. It was just standard. You come to rule, you pay the army this donativium. Okay. And, and the thing in Latin makes it you. sound official, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's just like, it's literally a bribe. Yeah. It was yeah. definitely a bribe. Or like a paycheck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but they already get a paycheck, but like, oh, okay. on this the turnover, uh, they also uh, give yeah. him extra money. Nice. Uh, uh, and to, to secure his, his, his title. Um, Unfortunately, the money really wasn't adding up on the right side of the ledger. Mm, the Phil. cost of the payments, the Sassanians, the bribes, the building of his stupid city. <laughs> <laughs> and he had then ruthlessly increased tax and cut back on subsidies to the tribes north of the Danube. So this left him with a very shaky northern border, insecure mm. finances, and rich people that didn't quite like him in the own city. So he was not building allies on his flanks yeah. or in the centre. He eventually then had to lead a campaign in the north against against invaders crossing the Danube, which he which he 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 won. So he actually won handily with his army, and he took the title of uh, Carpe, Carpicus Maximus. Oh yeah, biggest nice. complainer, biggest, massive carp, big Mass- big fish, <laughs> big fish. He's, he's big fish in the north. Yeah, yeah. Um, but <laughs> as he was out there campaigning with this war, 
Uh, the Sassians were stirring up again because the Armenians wouldn't recognize King Shapur. Okay. So Armenia, oh. which was fairly traded. But he, <laughs> yeah. he, gave, he gave Armenia he gave, away. Yeah. He gave, he gave them away. A whole country. <laughs> Just deal with it. So now at this stage, there were so many people now at the border. A bit of confusion on who was in power, who wasn't in power. Various peoples raiding and usurpers from within that Philip actually offered to resign to the Senate. Oh, oh wow. He, wow, that's quite mature. Yeah, really mature. Usually you just wait to get stabbed. Well, the Senate didn't let him because they probably wanted him to hang around long enough <laughs> oh. until he got stabbed. Oh. <laughs> um, but they backed him really you know, vociferously. Yeah, they really backed wow. him. Why? And so well, on he, what grounds? <laughs> I don't no idea, but they did. Uh, just they really liked him. Okay. Um, and so, you know, this renewed sense of confidence, uh, he decided to dispatch Decius, a general of his, to quell the north revolts and sent him up there. And it worked. So Decius went up there, remounted the armies out there, settled the whole region, hmm. quelled the barbarians, the Goths, whatever it is, coming over the, the borders. Uh, uh, but uh, Decius then proclaimed himself emperor. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so he sort of got a taste for power and the good life yeah. up on the Danube and said, I want to get this for me back home. Yeah. And he he then uh, he, he let it get to his head. And you so, dip your toe in the Danube and then all you can <laughs> yeah, think about is sea snails. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he marched back on Rome. Uh, so now... The money problems were getting worse. Uh, there was rioting in Egypt prior to this. Uh, meant the wheat supply was denuded, and this completely cut the legs from underneath Philip. So he had no resupply. Finances were poor. Warring fractions in the borders, and a new serper coming for him. It's an untenable position. It's not really good. And um, so Decius tries to to to, to parley. But Philip was having none of it, met him in battle, but was handily defeated. So Decius took control and in, he died in September 2049, uh, most likely by his own men. Uh, and his, Philip did. Philip was oh. killed by his own men, most likely. And it's also probably true that his young son at the time was killed. His 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 father and his brother, however, had disappeared without a trace, just slipped into the ether. Well, his father's a yeah. god, so he probably just went on up to heaven. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, true. Um, and that, that ended the reign Sorry, of Philip. That's logical. That's, um, yeah, that's history. And that is Philip the Arab. That ended his reign okay. uh, after coming to power. It didn't last too long. Uh, Decius didn't last much longer, by the way. Just spoiler alert. He only lasted two years and then was killed by goths. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, wow, that's... Philip. What a massive carp. <laughs> Philip, big Biggest fish, fish, small pond. <laughs> Briefly. Briefly. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I am talking about not Rome. I've decided to. <laughs> Is it anyone else? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've decided to look east, even past the Persians, and I'm in Vietnam. Oh, nice. Talking about the very interesting, though very little known, lady warrior named Lady True. Uh, and right off the bat, I want to say, yes, that is the name of a character in Watchmen. I haven't okay. seen the show, so I don't know if she's at all connected, but I think she probably is, mm. um, given what that show is about. So this is an historical person. And I did um, have to, uh, let's say, bend the rules a bit. <laughs> okay. This she, is where the ish comes in. She... Was alive in 244. Okay, great. Okay. Good enough for me. That's good enough. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, real good. The, the good stuff she did was not in 244. That's but fine. That's I think, fine. I think we can, these years you yeah. have some leeway, like, you know, a thousand years left or right, who cares? Yeah, yeah, you, you know, know, whatever. Also, this is <laughs> like, Even by that rule, you didn't <laughs> adhere to that. <laughs> yeah. 1,053 years out yeah. a few episodes ago. Yeah, so who, who's, who's going to begrudge me a few dozen months at this point. <laughs> uh, so our story today takes place in the first uh, pronunciation that I'm going to get horribly wrong. Don't worry, there are many more after mm -hmm. this. Excited. Takes place in Jiaozhou, which at this time is an imperial Chinese province under the Han Empire, but is part of modern day Vietnam, the northern part of Vietnam. And the ruler of Jiaozhou is a man named Xu Zhe. And uh, the Han Empire is crumbling, but since Jiaozhou is fairly remote, it doesn't really get caught up in the chaos. And Xi Zhe is able to rule effectively as an autonomous warlord over the province, even though he's technically still a subject of the Han. But because of this relative autonomy, this is also the beginning of a divergent Vietnamese identity. And some historians have called Xi Zhe the first Vietnamese. Hmm. 
Unfortunately for this nascent movement, the Han Empire fully crumbles in 220 and is succeeded by something called the Three Kingdoms period. And one of the kingdoms is Wu or Eastern Wu. And Eastern Wu is ruled by a man named Sun Quan, who is not as tolerant of the semi-autonomy in Vietnam, and he sets his sights on Shi Zhe. He wanted to give them full autonomy? He, yeah, is he that, was like, you know going? what? <laughs> you guys are doing great work over there. You're free. <laughs> um, or the opposite of yeah, that. Probably, probably the opposite. Probably the opposite. Yeah, in 226, it starts to really go south for Shi Zhe in that he dies. Um, <laughs> Uh, just of, of it's old It's as south age. as you get. It's yeah, as south yeah, yeah. as you get, yeah. Six feet under south. Um, he dies not in battle or anything. He's just quite old. I think he was 89, maybe. But because of this power vacuum, Sun Quan comes to the territory and kills Shi Zhe's son and brings the whole province under the rule of the Eastern Wu. But 226 is also the year in which today's heroine is born. Her actual given name is unknown, but she's called True Ti Trin, or usually just Lady True. Her parents died when she was young, and she was raised by her, his, her brother and his cruel wife. And as I've mentioned, in 244, Lady True is alive and well and doing things. <laughs> Tick! <laughs> is, that, is that it? Is that the only thing that she's done in 244, no. is just be alive? Well, okay, there's, first of all, not a whole lot written about her. So I don't know, like, what she was doing as a, what would she have been then? Like, 16-year-old, 18-year-old. She was probably, she was learning to vote and smoking yeah, her yeah. first cigarette. Yeah, Let's yeah, say yeah. that. Um, in 246, she kills her cruel sister-in-law. And flees to the mountains, possibly accompanied by her brother. And at this point, the Eastern Wu have Hang sent- on, let's just break that, yeah, that down sure. as a dynamic. Uh-huh. So, yeah, I was, I was wondering. So she's killed yeah, this guy's wife. His cruel wife. Fine. Yeah. But his wife. Yes. Who had helped raise her. Uh, yeah. And we're sort of 50-50 on whether he then went with her. Yeah. Hmm. It's possible that um, is there, was there like a thing? N- maybe he didn't like his wife. Yeah. Maybe they p- conspired to kill her, or maybe she just went nuts. And maybe, then he's may- like, maybe oh, just well. didn't happen. <laughs> maybe it didn't happen. Honestly, uh, maybe yeah, none of, of this happened. Yeah. <laughs> maybe okay, I'm yeah. making all of it up. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, at this point, the Eastern Wu have sent generals to the province to, quote, exterminate and pacify the barbarous tribes. Yeah, peaceful envoy. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> just a little diplomacy. Uh, Lady True decides to do something about it. In the mountains, she gathers a band of a thousand followers. And when her brother tries to persuade her not to rebel, she responds... I'd like to ride storms, kill orcas in the open sea, drive out the aggressors, reconquer the country, undo the ties of serfdom, and never bend my back to be the concubine of whatever man. Why should I imitate others, bow my head, stoop over, and be a slave? Why resign myself to menial housework? It's pretty good. I don't really know why she brings orcas into it. <laughs> like, she's quite far from the ocean. Yeah, but she wants to slay them yeah. or ride them. Which was slay it? them. Slay she them. wants to kill them. And they're quite majestic beasts, I yeah, would vicious, say. Though. But yeah. that's, that's a pretty good quote. I mean, It's a pretty good quote. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And in fact, it's so good that uh, it inspires her brother to join her fight. And he stops carping about uh, how, <laughs> how she shouldn't do this. And maybe she shouldn't have murdered his wife and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> Um, it all gets a little complicated because she's not mentioned in contemporaneous Chinese sources, but is described in later Vietnamese sources. But basically, in 248, she assembled the people along with her band of mountain rebels and attacks the Chinese in several places. She robs the Chinese. She fights them. She just generally causes havoc. And she's apparently made the leader of the rebellion because of her bravery. And these Mm. later Vietnamese sources include some really great descriptions of her. Um, several of which I will read right now. (laughs) Number one, when she went to battle, she wore gilded coarse tunics and toothed footwear. Sorry, toothed? Toothed. Uh, Toothed? hmm. Toothed. Like like at the bottom? Oh, now I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess like cleats or... um, Oh, is it like it had like... Like teeth. Uh, yeah. yeah, like oh, gri- right. grips. Okay, okay. Maybe. That's what I assumed. Okay. Maybe it just means... Like crampons. Her, her shoes had a smile. So, oh, yeah, she, so shoes with a decent grip on them. Shoes with yeah. a decent grip. Right. Which okay. is great for battle, I great think. Great for battle, You don't want to yeah. slip. Was that not common? 
Well. People slip the whole time, I guess. Yeah. She's and the why first... such coarse tunics? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, they're coarse and yet also gilded, which mm. I think is an interesting way of saying you're with the people, but also the leader of the people. Yeah, true. Oh, I You've see. got a golden potato sack yeah. <laughs> tied around your waist. <laughs> golden potato sack is exactly the direct <laughs> translation, I think. Uh, these descriptions, by the way, get go from progressively more boring to more interesting. So okay. number two, she had a voice like a temple bell and a beauty that could shake any man's soul. Bong. So you, yeah, you just talk to her, she'd be like, <laughs> bong. <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, maybe her beauty was shaking the man's soul because she was vibrating them with her temple bell voice. Uh, number three, she could eat many rice pecks and walk 500 leagues per day. That's a lot of leagues and a lot That's of rice. A lot. It's a lot of leagues. It's a lot of rice. How much? Uh, how, what's the distance in a single league? Uh, 500 leagues is... About 300 miles? It is... No, in a day. <laughs> yeah. 500 nautical leagues are 2778 kilometers. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Wait, yeah. 27... T- almost 3000 kilometers. Sorry, wow. 3,000 yeah, kilometers. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I just said that number really weirdly. 2,778 kilometers is 500 I mean, that's a lot of, I mean, that's, that's not a thing that's true. I mean, no wonder how? she ate so much rice. She had to fuel up. <laughs> she she really had to carbo load. Carbo and load. how much is in a peck of rice? How? <laughs> <laughs> One peck of rice. It's like four, four gigatons equals, or something. <laughs> equals, okay, it equals 8,809 milliliters, which I think is the... So equ- that's like probably like nine kilos of gr- rice. Yeah. Uh, how many, how many, it was eight, was it? Uh, f- uh, it was how many pecks? How many pecks? Many. She could pecks. eat many. Many. Yeah. What? So more than so. So basically, we're saying at least eighteen kilos of rice, <laughs> yeah. and she can travel three thousand kilometers a day. Yeah. Well, Ad- admirable. Now, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. She could walk five hundred leagues. Is per this day. the same source that's giving you all the rest of the information in this? <laughs> I mean, like, bit. Uh, could she walk five hundred more just to be the? <laughs> <laughs> woman Just to that, be the woman that ate rice pecks at your door. <laughs> yeah. Da, 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 da. Uh, Careful, copyright. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was just me screaming. Uh, number four, she rode a war elephant into battle. No, well, well, now I don't know what to believe. Yeah. I mean, maybe she, she walk. <laughs> now, actually, I should have done number five next because this could possibly explain how she can walk five hundred leagues per day. She was nine feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> But like, so that means she's on the elephant and her legs were just dragging along the floor. (laughs) Yeah. And that's not the only thing that's dragging because in multiple sources, they were, she was described as having three foot long breasts that she would tie behind her back when she charged into battle. I have never heard breasts <laughs> described in units of length before. They were a yard of long. everything of everything we've covered. <laughs> this is the most dubious <laughs> history. She would tie them behind, yeah. like to each other, like yeah. in a bow. Yeah. I'm not. I mean, I'm not an expert <laughs> on these sorts of things, but that doesn't sound. Incredible. Listen, listen oh. I can't believe that you're shocked that a description of a fairly inconsequential woman in the year 244 isn't flattering. <laughs> yeah, well, fully sourced and documented. Oh. But these are the facts <laughs> as reported to me. Well, fair enough. <laughs> so fascinating to hear about Vietnam at this point. <laughs> uh, it, it, if you can believe it, it gets even hazier after this. Imp- but impossible, completely impossible. <laughs> Essentially, after several months of warfare, her rebellion is defeated, in fact, quite easily, um, and she runs away and commits suicide. Um, Historians think that because the Chinese didn't even write about her in their histories, it shows that her rebellion was simply a, quote, kind of stubborn barbarism that was wiped out as a matter of course. Um, But the fact remains that she's become a folk hero in Vietnam, which I think shows that her story appeals to these kind of populist interests and her legend was handed down over generations as the concept of Vietnam or a Vietnamese identity grows. And she's still celebrated in Vietnam today with statues. She has streets named after her. She has (laughs) really heavy duty sports bras, all that good stuff. Okay, so she's like as legit as... Sir Lancelot and King Arthur. I think she's more legit than that. Like, I think, I don't 
you think she's a real historical I think figure? There's, I think she's a real historical figure. Just, I, obviously with lots of like embellishments yes, and stuff. Yeah, yeah okay, exactly. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not sure that, I think pretty much everyone agrees that she did exist. It's just, of course, you know, what of those descriptions. Whether she was, was like accurate. nine foot or eight foot five. Yeah, or, right, yeah. right. Yeah. She probably rounded up. Yeah, you know, she probably did, A yeah. clean nine. On her dating profile. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Swipe right. Uh, yeah, so that's the story of Lady True, about whom everything I've said is true. And oh, that was not an intentional pun. That's great. And Thanks. We should get an AI to design us an image of what she would look like. <laughs> and then we should place in a dating yeah. profile all the facts we think we know about her. We and see how successful that artists. dating profile yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really like a really good thing to do. And we can then talk about it and they release those as bonus episodes on the Patreon. I mean, I stopped listening when you said the only thing that happened in 244 was that she was 16 and yeah. everything else was just in a different year, so it didn't matter. Yeah, in exactly. Fact, maybe that should just be a podcast of its own. Okay. <laughs> spin off, that first spin off. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, so this week I'm going to talk about the Roman Emperor Diocletian. I'm sorry, Rome. I'm doing. I'm adding Amazing. to the Amazing. Wow. I love it. Uh, how this... t- how long were his breasts? <laughs> well, come on to that. <laughs> Diocletian was born in 244. Tick. Yay. Probably. And <laughs> <laughs> maybe it, there's actually a bracketing thing going on there, but yeah. Know, well, for the purposes of close this. enough. And he ruled from 284 until his abdication. Ooh. In 305. That's okay. very unusual. He was born Gaius Valerius Diocles to a low status family in the Roman province of Dalmatia, which now encompasses where? Czech Republic? Czechia? Nope. Croatia. Yes. yes. There Croatia, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Croatia and actually quite significant parts of the like, surrounding coast. bits. Yeah, but it's oh, yeah. much more, much larger than that in, in antiquity. And Diocles rose through the ranks of the military in his early career, eventually becoming a cavalry commander in the army of Emperor Carus. Mm-hmm. And after the deaths of Carus and his son Numerian on a campaign in Persia, mm-hmm. Diocles was then proclaimed emperor by the troops, oh. which was seemingly happening quite a lot all at that the time. Period. Yeah, it really was. Man, just, the just, troops. They just did what they wanted. They were didn't incredibly they? powerful. Just be popular with the troops. Yeah. Promise them riches. And Bribe anyways, them. so the title the, the title was also claimed by Carus' surviving son, Carinus, but Diocletian then defeated him quite quickly in battle, at the Battle of Margus. So that was all done. And uh, he then had his reign, which stabilised the empire and ended the crisis of the third century, wow. which we were just talking oh. about. Amazing. And he was later, uh, he later appointed a fellow officer, Maximian, as Augustus, which means, which at the time meant your, the Augustus was the, co, the co-emperor. Huh in 286. So they split things up between them with uh, Diocletian took over the Eastern Empire, mm-hmm. which centred on the place that wasn't yet called Constantinople, but uh, it's going to be called yes. Constantinople. And Maximian reigning in the Western Empire centred on, on Rome. And then he further delegated again in 293. So he appointed two other people as co-emperors, mm-hmm. junior to the other two. So God, that's a that's a real hierarchy. Yeah. So not so much, not, not, not a hierarchy, in fact, so much as a tetrarchy. Uh-huh. And this yes. tetrarchy, the period known as the tetrarchy, the rule of four, uh, then it was established in which each emperor ruled over a quarter division of the empire. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then Diocletian, throughout his reign, spent a lot of time trying to secure the empire's borders. So he made a huge effort to fight off anyone who was threatening his power, including a successful campaign against the Sassanids. Yay. Who are the common like enemy, constant enemy yep. during this period. And he sacked their capital in 299 uh, and then led a bunch of negotiations, which basically imposed peace for mm-hmm. quite a while. Yeah. So, like, he nailed this whole Sassanid problem. Was he um, focused on expanding the borders of just his quarter or was he looking out for the whole borders? No, I think he was the Uber Emperor. The Uber, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. this is kind of the start as well of this separation of Eastern and Western Roman empires, right? Yeah, it and started the, very yeah. swiftly after this. Yeah, yeah, okay. Exactly. And all was going fine, really, and history would probably smile on Diocletian, except that Uh-oh. in 303... Wait, like, can we guess? Killed an orca. <laughs> <laughs> That's Ant's guess. When your guess, Anna? Sea snail massacre. Sea snail massacre are the two guesses. No, incorrect. He began the bloodiest ever persecution of Christians. Oh, no. Called the, the Diocletianic persecution. Okay. I knew there was... Like, I've heard his name before... And I don't know much about Rome, 
So if I know someone's name, it's because they did something bad. Yeah, so. yeah. Like, not for whimsy reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, the main reason people know about him now, I think, in the West is because the Christians then wrote about him a lot. Yeah. yeah okay. So uh, in 303, those yeah. four emperors issued a series of edicts rescinding Christians' legal rights and demanding that they comply with traditional religious practices. And later on, some edicts targeted the clergy and demanded universal sacrifice, uh, ordering all inhabitants and inhabitants to sacrifice to the gods. Oh, including that other emperor's dad? Uh, <laughs> I guess so. I guess Wait, he's in the pantheon now. Yeah. They would have to sacrifice themselves or like offer sacrifice? Offer sacrifice. Of, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because it was. I think I think the offering of sacrifice had been, you know, a staple of okay, yeah. Roman religious worship for right, a thousand okay. more years. Yeah. And, and, and the Christ, one of the reasons they were not with the Christians is they rejected these like very traditional things. Yeah. yeah. And I just had a totally different view of everything. And the persecution, it varied in intensity quite a bit. So it was actually at its weakest in Gaul and in Britain, mm -hmm. uh, where which was a very liberal place <laughs> at the time. And the, uh, it was at its strongest in the eastern provinces where he had more power, Diocletian had more power. And the Christians had been subject to intermittent local discrimination like throughout the whole empire. But uh, emperors prior to Diocletian were reluctant to issue general laws yeah. just... Uh, encouraging people to persecute them outright. Uh, so in the first 15 years of his rule, he had purged the whole army of Christians and had surrounded himself with public opponents of Christianity. And he had a preference for activist government and wanted to foster an image as a guy who's going to restore Rome to yeah. its former greatness. Mm -hmm. And all this foreboded like the biggest persecution in Roman history. And for the Romans, like that's... That's yeah, really that's saying something. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. they're pretty persecuty. Uh, so, by in the emperor, in, in the winter of three hundred two, so right towards the end of his his uh, reign, um, he he begun this general persecution of the Christians, um, and he was at first he was wary of what to do. So he went to mm. the oracle to uh -oh. ask for some guidance. Yep. yep. And the oracle then very conveniently endorsed the whole thing. Kill of course. Christians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and was yeah. like totally up for the for up for it. So yeah. it began the following year. Wow. And uh, some historians consider that in the centuries that followed the persecutory mm -hmm. era, that the Christians created this cult of martyrs that mm. exaggerated the barbarity of the whole thing. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. But uh -huh. that's that is contested. So, so other, there are other historians who say that it's the evidence justified. points to the fact it was yeah. like yeah, genuinely yeah, yeah. as bad Everything as they said. Everything that happened happened. Yeah, yeah. But, but is, there's some contestation around like huh. how much it was. I, I mean, um, like if you do read about any of the saints and stuff from this time, the martyrs, it's absolutely insane what the writings are saying. Yeah. Happened to them. How like, they're it's killed completely and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Complete, and like you know, even if it's like ten percent true, it's still like yeah. a bit OTT. Yeah. And I think it all played. That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> and it all played to this, you know. Uh, uh, well, I mean, there was a lot of obsession with the way in which you're dying in early Christianity, yes. right? Because yeah. of, for obvious reasons, because yeah, that's like yeah. the main thing. Um, so yeah, it obviously all played up to that. Uh, but yeah, there's there's significant evidence to say it was genuinely as bad as as, yeah, they, yeah, as yeah. they were saying. Really? Um, so despite these um, like snags, uh, <laughs> oh <my> Diocletian's <laughs> <laughs> societal reforms more broadly, yeah, yeah. like fundamentally changed the structure of Roman society and government, and they helped to stabilize the empire in what had in his like in his youth had been like a really turbulent yeah extremely turbulent period yeah, gotcha. in which the empire was like going to completely collapse probably in, in the next few decades and he managed to stabilize all that wow. despite being clearly a genocidal monster yeah. in the other yeah. half of his life and uh, later on interestingly he got pretty ill so he left office in 305 and be uh, thus becoming the first roman empire em em the first roman emperor to abdicate the position voluntarily wow and he lived out his retirement in a palace on the Dalmatian coast, tending to his vegetable gardens. Oh, oh that wow. sounds very lovely. And his palace eventually became the core of modern day split in uh, Croatia. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. very cool. So there you are. Uh, he knew when to call it quits, not like your dude. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Rock, yeah. Just like most abdications up to then have been very stabby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sort of involuntary, yeah, involuntary abdication. abdication. Yeah. Well, sometimes when the when the vegetables call, you have to answer. <laughs> there you go, Emperor Diocletian. Fine until the genocide. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, that's everything you'd ever, ever need to know about the year 244. Ish. <laughs> Ish. <laughs> uh, and that means it's time for us to choose the next one. So, Will, can you please boot up the random number generator? I absolutely can, and I'm just... Do you have enough dilithium crystals for it this week? Pouring in yeah. the dilithium crystals. There was an Amazon delivery earlier. I think that may have been a, some, some more 
crystals. Oh dear. In retrospect, I now feel bad having to use three tons of carp and orca <laughs> in its place <laughs> to fuel the machine. That's what that smell is. And the next year is... 1732. 1732. Mm. Okay. God, there's going to be so much factual history there in that one. Be <laughs> yeah. French. People will be able to check our facts. People will about be able to check year. our facts. Probably no one will be nine feet tall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but that's exciting, though. 1732. Yeah, we've done, so, well, hang on, we did 1795. We did 1795. Have we done another 1700? No, That's it. well, in the last episode, yeah, okay, 1789. Last episode. Yeah. So this is our first, our second 1700s, yeah. 18th century. One. That's right. Great. Cool. That's great. Okay, cool. Looking forward to it. See you next week. Toodles. Bye. Bye.